Okay, so, well, thank you so much for coming. We'll do that. Okay. It'll work. If it falls off, we'll stop. Is it where you can hear me okay? <laughs> okay. I can talk louder. All right, so before we get started, something I'm going to have you do throughout when I'm speaking today is have you be like in a little group and say something to each other. So what I want to do before I get started, so we're not doing this later, is it's going to be like a group of four or five. So it could be like the two people behind you or the two people in front of you. Just establish that now, like so you can hear each other though. So it might not, a row might not be great. So just four or five, real quick. And if you have to switch, doesn't matter if you know them or not. If you don't have a group, then butt in and say I'm in your group now. All set? Got your group. All right, if somebody comes in late, please include her in your group. If you end up with six, it's you know not going to hurt anything. That's okay. So, did you love Pastor Stephen's book, Greater? I absolutely love him. He is an amazing, amazing teacher. And again, before I get started, I'm going to give you a piece of advice if you have not figured this out yet. He has an app. It's called Elevation. It's a little orange box with a, it's kind of a mountain, or if you're Greek, it's a lambda, or uh, upside down V, but that's what it looks like. There's another one called Elevation. It's not that one. It's the orange one. And his sermons are on this app, so you can listen to his sermons. And so every morning when I'm putting on my makeup and my doing my hair, I listen to a 45-minute sermon from Pastor Stephen. And so it has completely changed the way I feel every single morning. So his sermons are on there back to January of 2013, and then the ones before that are on his podcast. So you can actually download podcasts from him. And there is one from Greater. So that was September of 2012. So if you go back and find it, you can listen to a four-part series on Greater. So you can hear what you just read about, but in a sermon form, it is fantastic. So I highly, highly recommend you do that. So as I was reading Greater, of course, I wasn't just thinking of the spiritual parts of it, but also how it could impact my business. And I'm sure most of you were doing that too, considering you were doing it for pay setters. And so you wouldn't be here right now if you didn't want greater. Like you would have looked at the work and you would have looked at the book and gone, eh. But instead, you read the book, you did the work, and you're here. So I'm going to talk with you about what I learned as I was going through it and how I kind of put it together in my brain and hopefully that'll help you in putting some of the pieces together as well. So one of the first things that really spoke to me, not one of the first, but one of the things that spoke to me was dig, oh I heard somebody say it, digging your ditches, right? We have to dig our ditches. So just to remind you of the story, because there were lots of parts to the story, this part of the story was about Elisha, and this is when Elisha was um, quite a bit older, so this was far on, when he had already been performing miracles, and he was known as the guy who did miracles. And so there were some kings that came to Elisha and said, hey, we need your help. Our armies are dying in the desert, they're dying of thirst, and we need help. Can you talk to God for us, and please you know, find out what he says. What do we need to do? So he's, he, he wasn't real thrilled with these particular guys, but because of his respect for King Jehoshaphat, he said, okay, I'll talk to God for you. Let me see what he says. So he talks to God, and God says, what I want is for your army to dig ditches. I'll bring the rain. You dig the ditches. And it wasn't go dig one ditch. It wasn't go dig two ditches. It was a valley full of ditches. So you know they probably weren't all super excited <laughs> about doing that, but they did it. They obeyed, and what happened? Down comes the rain. God brings the rain. And so I thought, okay, how does this relate? How does this relate with my business? Well, I really do think there's one kind of ditch that we need to constantly be digging, and it's parties. And so our ditches are parties because everything happens at the parties. We sell at the parties. If it's a full circle party, we're sharing at the parties. So full circle par full circle parties, that's our ditches. And do we need one ditch? No. Oh. Two? No. We need a valley full of parties, right? <laughs> so, so that's what our business is all about, is building those parties. Now, when 
they were going to build the stitch, they didn't sit there and think about water. They didn't look up and visualize the rain coming down. They went out and did it, right? So don't think too hard about your parties. Let's get out and actually do them. So we know that only God can bring the rain, but he does expect us to dig the ditches. However, if you've been around Mary Kay long enough, you know that sometimes we have little issues with our ditches. So uh, some of the issues, and, and Pastor Stephen talked about this too, was that we don't think big enough or we don't start small enough. So we don't think big enough. So let's say a consultant comes to me and says, I want to be in my red jacket by seminar. I'll go, gosh, that is a great goal. How about career conference? Let's think a little bigger. Gosh, we've got a month till career conference. We've got time here. We, we, we could do this. So I would think she's not quite thinking big enough. She's thinking that's a good thing, but is it big enough? Or she's saying, I'm going to be an NSD. And she hasn't had a party in three months. So <laughs> you might need to start a little smaller <laughs> and then work your way out. So we all have obstacles that kind of get in our way of digging our ditches sometimes. Sometimes it's mental, it's fear, it's sometimes it's just being lazy, sometimes it's a health issue, sometimes it can be, you know, we, we do the whole blame game as to why we can't do it, but we do have moments when we're not digging our ditches. So in your small group, I'll tell you about the small group. We're, I'm going to give you like three minutes with the small group. So if you each take a minute, it's too long. All right, so it's a real quick, quick time together. And it's not a time where you're going to judge each other, okay? <laughs> so it doesn't matter what she says. But it's also not for advice. It's a matter of you getting to vocalize what, you, what comes to your mind. You're sharing that, and then that's, that's the extent of it. Now, if you do have advice or something for somebody afterwards, would be great. I'm sure she'd love to hear it. So for an example, for this one, what you're going to say in your small group is what is something that stops you from digging your ditches? So let me give you an example of what not to do. Let's say it is a health thing. Like you're like, oh, my health is just not good right now. I'm going through chemo. It's really tough. Instead of somebody going, um, you know, it, it would be like, oh, you know, I, I, I'm sorry to hear that. That's, that's tough. You know, that's going to be a tough one to go through. That would be good. But not, oh, my aunt went through chemo and this is what she did and this is what she did. Okay, that's not what we're doing right now. So in your small group, it's just what is it? Just that one thing, because there's probably more than one, um, that one thing that stops you from digging a ditch. I want you to vocalize it. Okay, go. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, and we're going to have more time for that. So let's say you're digging, and you're digging, and you're digging. Rain. <laughs> Try the other hand. <laughs> digging. And there's no rain. It happens, right? So maybe it's time to stir some things up. <laughs> so by stirring things up, Pastor Stephen told the story of burning your plow. So just as a reminder of the story, Elisha, now this is before he's performed any miracles, brand new, he's out in the fields, and he is doing his job. His job is to plow the fields. And so he is behind a team of oxen, he's plowing the fields, he has a good job. It's day in, it's day out, it's plowing the fields. It's good work, he's an, it's honest work, he's plowing the fields. What is his view every day? The bath of the oxen, right, right. Probably doesn't smell real good either. So, um, so it's not that it's a bad job, but it's not a greater job. So Elijah comes, and it's very symbolic. He puts his cloak around him. And Elisha knows, I meant for greater. And what Elisha does, he doesn't go and give us two weeks' notice. He doesn't go talk to the committee and find out what everybody else thinks before he decides to make this decision. He goes and he burns his plows. And then he cooks up his oxen and gives it to his friends and family for dinner. <laughs> There's no turning back. He knows that if maybe he sold his plows or gave them to his family members, that you know, he might have that out then. So he burns his plows. He says, I'm not turning back. I'm meant for greater. So. 
that can be figurative. You don't have to go burn something, but it might be fun. You know, <laughs> there might be something to do. But, but really, what I think it comes down to three things when when we're with our Mary Kay business. That it's one of those three we have to burn, if not more. Remember, he burned plows and oxen, so plural. So there might be one more than one thing that you have to burn. So. Uh, for Mary Kay, I think it's either time, money, or emotional. There's something with time management that you need to burn. Maybe like every day you're completely exhausted, but it's because you stay up really late. Like I love Jimmy Fallon, but there are times I just got to go to bed. Sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. So it's staying up late. Maybe that's what it is. So something with time management that you need to burn. It could be a money management thing that you need to burn. So maybe it's, a, maybe it's a credit card that you know you should not be using anymore, but you keep going to Kohl's anyway. <laughs> so stop that. And you see, so you know, this has got to go. So cutting it off would work. You know, if you burn it, it'd melt fun probably, but, yeah. but it's, it is, maybe it's a money management issue that you need to burn. Or maybe it's an emotional management issue that you need to burn. And emotional could come in all kinds of ways. Maybe it's what you're feeding your brain. Um, people who have just this oh, like everybody's out to get them feel, then I listen to them and they watch like the local news every morning. So you know when you turn on the news in the morning, the first thing you hear is everybody who died the night before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not good for your brain. Or they love CSI, like they don't miss an episode of CSI. Well, if you think the whole world runs like CSI, that's not good for you either. Um, or it could be even like Desperate Housewives, you know, not, that's not everybody's family. So what are you feeding your brain? Some emotional management might be a good thing too. So it usually comes down to money or time or emotion when it comes to our businesses. I think most women leave Mary Kay because one of those three is out of whack. I really do think that that's what it is. So I want you to think about your plow because something came to mind. Something came to mind and you're like, oh, there's a plow I need to burn. So think about what would you gain if you burned that plow? Like you could feel it like the credit card bill is gone, or just all of that emotional ugh is gone, or I have the energy every day because I'm getting my sleep, whatever it is, what would you gain if you burn the plow? Now for me, negative works sometimes. We like to think positively, but sometimes negative works. So if that isn't stirring you, what will you lose if you don't burn your plow? What will you lose if you don't burn your plow? Stir it up. Stir it up. So I want you to figure out one of the plows in your head. You have a few of them running around in there. One that you don't mind sharing. <laughs> and so in your small group, I want you to either tell the group either what is one of your plows that you need to burn, or it could be how are you going to stir things up. So a plow you need to burn or how you're going to stir things up. Okay, go. <laughs> Next one. I believe, as Mary Kay consultants, we all have a silver spoon in our mouths. Now, that's usually meant for others, right? We never say that about ourselves. She was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. What does that mean? It means that she was born into prosperity. She was born into abundance, and she doesn't appreciate it. I believe that we might have a silver spoon of Mary Kay because even people who have been with the company over 40 years aren't Mary Kay Ash. They didn't start from ground zero. Now they may have started where nobody really knew what Mary Kay was, but no one in here was one of the first nine, right? It was established for us already. So what are we pretending not to know? <laughs> because we have it. Pastor Stephen reminded us that we need to make a daily decision for greater. How many of you went to Chicago Rama? Were you like so on fire by the time you left? Yeah. You still on fire? Yeah. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> have you had a dull moment here or there? Yeah, yeah that probably. So there are times that we get a little dull. Our passion is gone a little bit. However, has the company changed? Have the products changed? Has the opportunity changed? Or 
are we not maybe appreciating what we have at that moment? When we start to question our opportunity, the opportunity hasn't changed. So it's kind of that silver spoon mentality, right? We have this great abundance, but we don't appreciate necessarily what it's all about. So we have to recognize our silver spoon moments, I think. Uh, I'll tell you about my silver spoon moment last Monday, a week ago Monday. I was just having this moment and like everything that was coming in was just not fun. Like every text and boxer message and calls and it got to be about two o'clock and I'm like, I'm done, I'm done. And realizing it's Monday and I have a meeting that night so I can't be done. So, okay. So in that silver spoon moment, what do you do? And what happened, thank you Pastor Stephen, was greater. The word greater came into my head. Now just the word did nothing for me, I'll tell you that. Like, oh, I'm going to be great. Never mind. <laughs> no. <laughs> I had to come up with something. Now for me, praise music does it like almost every time. So I thought, all right, Mandisa, you and me, baby. We're going to get out of this funk. So put on Mandisa. Within about two songs, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling like, okay, I can make this happen again. So you have to be able to recognize your silver spoon moments in order to be greater. So, when you're having a silver spoon moment, have that feeling of, okay, I need to appreciate the joys of my Mary Kay business. I know the business is still there. I know the business is still great. But how can I personally get out of it? And we all have different things that we do. So what we're going to talk about, and these, you might have a way that somebody else has never heard about before and how you get yourself out of that. Now, one of the great ways we always hear is you call up, you call your director, right? That's not an option in your groups right now. So let's pretend your director is completely unavailable and you have to get out of it now, like right now. What do you do? When you recognize your silver spoon moment, how, how do you become greater and get out of it? Okay, go. I have a measuring spoon. <laughs> Our measuring spoons help us to determine how much, right? We don't want too much of something in a recipe. We don't want not enough of something in a recipe. So it really tells us how much. We want a precise measurement. Well, we tend to do this sometimes with our faith, too. We start to measure it. So we think about that we want to make sure we have enough faith. We, if we, if we don't have enough, then we know things aren't going to work. Like, we're going to get stuck. We're not going to be able to move forward. We're going to keep wondering, why isn't this working? Well, it's because our faith you know, is messed up. So we, we want to make sure we measure enough faith. But the flip side of it happens sometimes when we go, oh, I don't want to have too much faith. Right? Which you think, is that right? But you heard the expression. You've said the expression, don't get your hopes up. Well, that's having too much faith. And, and you wonder where you're putting your faith. Because it is completely possible to have too much faith in someone who has shown you over and over and over and over again who they are. Is it possible to have too much faith in God? No. So it, it, we're measuring, be careful of how you're using your measuring spoon and who you're using your measuring spoon on. We also want to be careful sometimes that we don't want our faith wasted. We feel like it's wasted or, or there might be a setback or there might be some kind of suffering that happens if we put a bunch of faith into something. And we all know that our journey toward greater is going to take great faith. And we also know that we know that we know that the journey is not always going to be easy. It isn't. There are bad things that are going to happen. It's just going to happen. So what Pastor Stephen talked about was having a faith trust fund. And how when you're just moving forward and you don't see things happening, they're just not measuring up, keep going. Because it's not being wasted. It's being put in this faith trust fund. Let me give you an example. You've had a week where you have a zero party and the girl that says she's going to be on your team decides not to be on your team or the girl that is on your team decides to never talk to you again or you have, you know, some, something happens and something happens and you're, oh my goodness, really? But you keep going. 
and your deposits into your faith trust fund keep happening. And then you have that week where someone calls and says, I'd like to be on your team again. It's been 10 years, but I want to get started. And then you have a website order that's huge. And you're like, I'm so lucky. No, you're not. <laughs> that's in your faith trust fund. Your efforts are blessed. Being an entrepreneur, you don't have, I work this many hours and get this much pay. And I work this many hours and I get this much pay. As an entrepreneur, you might work this many hours and get this much pay. But then you work this many hours and get this much pay. That's being an entrepreneur and understanding that and your faith moves you forward. You keep working even when you're going rain. <laughs> that faith trust fund is being built. So remember too that God is behind the scenes and he's orchestrating things for you. He's orchestrating events. You chose to obey. You're here. He's putting people in your path. You ever had that little gut feeling where, like, I'm supposed to talk to her? Yep. And then you get home and you go, I didn't talk to her, right? And you're like, oh, start obeying. When you get that gut, go talk to her. Yeah. Go talk to her. And maybe, maybe she's not supposed to be your next hostess. Maybe she's not supposed to be on your team. Maybe she just needed a smile from a friendly person and God's using you. Maybe that's what it is. So really start listening. That's part of our trust fund. That's part of it, is that listening and obeying. We tend to be really good at measuring the negatives. Like, we can tell somebody all about our bad day. This happened and this happened and this happened, right? We can measure that. But how good are we at measuring the positives? I have a really good example of a positive for you today. Did you wake up? He has something greater planned for you today, or he wouldn't have woken you up. So, thank you. So, in your small groups, I would like you to talk about why did he wake you up today? Go ahead. So our next spoon has another, probably more negative connotation to it, kind of like the silver spoon. This one is being spoon-fed. Now it's again, not something we tend to say about ourselves very often. It refers to somebody who has so much done for them that they don't have to think for themselves. They don't have to do for themselves. Teenagers, right? <laughs> Quite often those teenagers come to mind, but there are times when something gets in our way of stepping into our greater, even though we're being spoon fed. So as a red jacket, I remember sitting and watching newer directors get up and give speeches and they'd say, I just did what my director told me to do. <laughs> and every time I'd sit there and go, that's why she's a director. My director doesn't tell me to do anything. <laughs> and I seriously thought that. Like, I thought they didn't tell me. And I had two because I was an adoptee. So I had my director I saw every single week. And I also had one on the phone. And they never told me to do nothing. I just, that's why she was successful. If I had her director, I'd be a director too. <laughs> and at one point it dawned on me, and I don't know when or where, but it hit me that just because they didn't say, Tanya, didn't mean they weren't telling me to do something. Let me give you an example. Do your six most important things list. You write down the six most important things so the next morning you're ready to go. But I never had my director say, Tanya, do your six most important things list. <laughs> the weekly plan sheet. I knew every color, what to highlight it, everything to do. Put it on the fridge so your family sees it. But nobody said, Tanya, do your weekly plan sheet. And it dawned on me, oh, <laughs> there are probably other things my director has told me to do that I didn't quite catch that she was telling me to do it, not just the group. For instance, be a star consultant every quarter. 
Turn in your weekly accomplishment sheets for accountability. Every challenge and contest the company or director gives you, do them. Go to every meeting and every event. Sign up your customers for PCP. It's God first, family second, career third, but not 33rd. <laughs> Paperwork and relax time is before 9 a.m. and after 9 a.m. A tracked number grows, track everything. Read positive books, have affirmations, listen to Mary Kay's CDs and downloads, hold parties, share the product and the opportunity with everyone, bring guests, the list goes on and on. <laughs> Oh, she was telling me to do something. <laughs> I was being spoon-fed how to be a leader in Mary Kay. Just do this. Just do it. So Pastor Stephen called the Captain Awesome Sauce. Yeah. I thought that was a fun one. That was a good one. And that's when God says, do this. And you go, oh, God, I will do anything for you, except that. You meet low fans, I will do anything for love, but I won't do that, right? Okay, so I was singing, see? Um, so if God is calling you to do something greater, it's time to obey. It's time to listen. And every time you do that, you're adding to your faith trust fund. He's saying, here. See this lady over here? I'm giving her right to you. And you go, oh, not that one. Too scary. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <sighs> make sure, make sure that you're being obedient. So in your small groups right now, I want you to think about what have you been spoon-fed to do that you are now, and I gave you a big list if you want to choose from one of those. You've been spoon-fed to do. And you're now saying, I'm going to be obedient. That's the first one right there. Okay, go ahead. All right, ladies, imagine with me for a moment. One of your moments of real disappointment. Many of you, it was probably right at the beginning of your Mary Kay career. That moment when you are ready to give up, you're ready to quit, you're ready to burn your starter kit and call it your plow. <laughs> You crawl onto your bed, and you curl up in a ball, and you just cry. I want you to imagine then that God comes and he puts his arms around you, and he holds you tightly, and he encourages you to keep going and keep trying. We don't usually think about God spooning us. <laughs> However, isn't it a fun image <laughs> to have that hug, that feeling of just, it's going to be okay. And then think, what is the next step that he whispers to you? In the story, Elisha, he had burned his plows and he went through years and years of apprenticeship with Elijah. And it comes to a moment where Elijah knows that his time has come. He's done. He's going to heaven. And they're going together, and they've got about 50 guys with them. And they're going, and Elijah says, Elisha, stay here. I'm going ahead. And Elijah says, no, I'm coming with you. He says, all right, come on. So they go. And he, again, he stops, and he says, no, this is where you stop. I'm going on my own. And Elisha says, no, I'm coming with you. And they get to the Jordan River, and he says, I'm going across. You stay here with the guys. He says, no, I'm coming with you. And fine. He takes his cloak. And Elijah has done so many miracles by this time. He takes his cloak and he hits the river. He strikes the water. And the waters part. And there they go. The two of them together cross. The 50 guys stay on the other side. And he gets to the other side. And great chariots of fire take Elijah. And he goes up to heaven. And Elisha witnesses all of this. And he's devastated. And he's in grief. And we know he's angry because he rips at his own clothes. And he's so distraught. And imagine God coming to him and just coming around and comforting him and saying, it's your turn. Use everything that Elijah has taught you. You've watched it all. It's your turn. Your next step is to strike the water yourself. And so he picks up Elijah's coat and he 
drops it. He strikes the water. The water parts, and he's able to walk across to the other side. His first miracle, what he did first. But who was watching? The 50 guys were watching. They knew that he was being groomed to be greater. They knew that he had something in him. And they're cheering him on. They want him to succeed. Do you have those people in your life that are watching you? It's your friends. It's your family. It's your sister consultants. They're watching you. And they know you're being groomed for greater. And it's your turn to strike the water. So, you're going to need to dig a valley full of ditches. You're going to need to stir some things up. You're going to need to burn a plow. You're going to need to recognize your silver spoon moments. Reignite your own passion. You're going to need to measure the cost of your faith versus your fear. Be obedient to what is being spoon-fed to you. And when you're ready to give it all up, let God spoon with you surround you, comfort you, encourage you, speak to you, and then go strike 